Barry Gordy was my mentor, my teacher, and um, I started with Please Mr. Postman, which you guys might have heard on Oldies and Goodies. That was the first record I played. And I made the Supremes stars here in Los Angeles before they were stars anywhere in the world. And I made Marvin Gaye star here in Los Angeles before he was a star anywhere in the world. In fact, we went out to Jefferson High with Marvin Gaye, and he did a concert out there and got mobbed because he didn't realize he was a star. So that's how I, I was fortunate enough to uh, have a great teacher. And gradually I worked and worked, and I like Tim said, I work at night and day trying to become somebody in the music business. And a group came along and, uh, in 61, and uh, they were called the Pendletons. I changed their name to the Beach Boys. And the Beach Boys are still going out and doing 200 concerts a year after 50 years. And they're still going strong. And then I left that situation and became an uh, executive, if you will, at Universal City Records, which is Universal Studios over here. And the first act that I signed over there was Neil Diamond. Neil Diamond is still going strong after all these years. And the other night I went to the Staples Center. I signed Elton John 45 years ago. And Elton John is 18,000 people were going crazy at the, which makes you feel good, you know what I mean? And I have a saying, by the way, when your vocation is your vacation, you never go to work. So I've never worked a day in my life. <laughs> but anyway, um, after uh, Elton John, I signed another John named Olivia Newton-John, who did movies and became a star. And then, lo and behold, my man, the greatest of all time, we raised the birth rate of America by 5% with his music, Barry White. I signed Barry White. <laughs> we made music for the bedrooms of America. Anyway, uh, he, he was my guy. I love him. He's been gone about 10 years now. And, I still miss him. And then I did things like rock, you know, with Alan Parsons Project, and basically uh, four movies that won Academy Awards. I did the first breakdance movies. You might have seen, have you, on video, DVD, or whatever. Have you seen a movie called Breakin'? I did Breakin'. You ever see that with Ice? Ice-T was in that movie. I put Ice-T in that movie. And that was one of the first hip-hop, really hip-hop movies. I did Breaking 1 and Breaking 2, and they did very well. And I did Flashdance, the movie, which won an Academy Award, and Chariots of Fire, and Poseidon Adventure won an Academy Award, and Towering Inferno. So I've had four Academy Awards, pictures of one Academy Award. So I've been doing this, you know, as you know, about 50 years. And I'm still doing it. Like the last artist that I worked with was Akon. You know, I didn't just stand still. Akon is still a good friend, and he did very well, and we're not, I'm not doing anything with him right now, but um, we were together for a couple of years. But in 91, after all this success, I saw the hip-hop situation coming, really getting stronger, and I signed South Central Cartel, and we made our first real, you know, rap album with South Central Cartel, which did very well. And then there was a Hispanic act called Lighter Shader Brown. We made an album with them, and that was a big hip hop album also. And Havoc and Prodigy, who will be here, Havoc will be here later, but they sold a lot of records. So I got in the hip hop game because this is what's happening. It was like, it kind of reminded me of rock and roll, where parents hated rock and roll, and the kids loved it. Well, today, you know, as you know, parents hate hip hop, but the kids love it. So it's an art form that I don't think is ever going away. It's going to stick around for a long time because an expression of, of reality. It's very real. I mean, people are rapping and, and singing about their real life situations that they're in. But then later on, I, I made a kind of a big mistake in a way by doing a project called Banging on Wax with the Bloods and the Crips. 
I said, well, if I'm going to do gangster music, I might as well do real gangster music. So, and they were real gangsters. You say you uh, you worked with them? Yeah, I signed, I did that album. He's, re he's oh, responsible for the album. I did the album, Banging on Wax, which is kind of a classic yeah, thing. I I'll show you guys some footage from, uh, I got a couple of the artists, I interviewed them that were on that album. The only dangerous part of doing business with gangsters is they think you're a gangster. <laughs> and so when their royalties came out, when I gave them a check for the selling, it wasn't enough. They thought I was cheating, okay? And I never cheated anybody. I'm one of the few guys in the record business, and you can, you can Google me, Russ Regan. I've never been sued because I've never cheated anybody. But anyway, they thought I did, and then I started getting death threats in the mail. In red, I get from the, from the bloods, I get red death threats, and I get blue ones from the red. <laughs> <laughs> so I get two different kind of colors. But it was scary because it, it was pretty serious about them coming after me, and then I had a young son at that time, he's 21 now, but they were going to take my son and all kinds of, it's all, it all involved. But I finally uh, met with the head of the, the group, and I said, look, I'm not fooling around anymore with, about this. I'm going to the FBI with this. I'm not going to LAPD, because you guys use the US mail to mail me these death threats, and that's a federal crime. So when I mentioned the word FBI, I think they, they finally backed off. But the, the thing about, which was sad for me, was the first AME church out in South Central, part of my deal with signing Bangin' on Wax was for the Reverend Murray to get part of the royalties from that album to the first AME church, because he was a good friend and still is a good friend of mine. And um, they said, okay, and we gave, him, we gave the church money, and a lot of the kids that didn't have any careers at all, all of a sudden were making money. They did make money, but it was never enough, is what I'm trying to get at. But the hip hop culture, which you're about to, I guess, are you, some of you going in the record business here? Or anybody going in the record business? One guy. <laughs> all right. Well, it's still, a, look, people need music in their lives. It'll never stop. It's, it's a culture that's not going to disappear. And uh, it's going to be around for quite a while. And I think if you can get into it and get a, the right people to mentor you, because you do need mentoring. And it's changed from what the years that I came up in this business. It's changed a lot because of the delivery system. I mean, people don't go in the record stores anymore and buy records. If they're going to get a song or a, a joint, as a lot of people say, uh, they're, they're going to download it. Illegal or illegally or illegally, and you know, have it on their I, I, iPhone or whatever they want to put on, and so that's what the new music business is. And basically, because of what's happened to the delivery system in the music business, the contracts have changed. Back in the day, when I had superstars they could go out and do $40 million worth of concerts, and I wouldn't get five cents. You know, I, I made my living on selling records. But now, today, if you sign an act, you've got to put up what they call a 360 deal. You not only sign them to make music, but you sign them for their concert income. Write that down. Concert income for their merchandise when they sell t-shirts and stuff, for publishing. They get music, I mean, they get money from all these different areas that we never got money for. Only because so much of the music today, unfortunately, is being downloaded illegally. And a lot of these artists can't make a living, and the record companies can't stay in business if nobody's getting paid. The whole key is to get paid for some reason, and I don't know why this is, but kids think Music should be free. You know, I don't know why, but it's just the way it is. And it's not free. People work hard to re write songs, to go in and sing them, record them, and stuff like that. And it costs money to make these records. But so a lot of them 
go in and make these records and people download them illegally. But I've often said the only good, out of, I'm a great believer, out of bad comes good. The only thing bad, a good that comes out of the bad is if somebody downloads your song as you're an artist illegally. That means they must like it, right? They're not going to download something they don't like. So if they like it, maybe they might become a fan. And guess what? Fans buy tickets. And so that's what the good news is. So a lot of these kids are even actually thinking about giving a single away for nothing or whatever because kids that download that single illegally or legally, you know, whatever it is, will buy a ticket to their concerts. And that's where they make their money, at the concert level. So that's a new music business, if you will. And, you know, I'm still doing it. I, I, I love what I do, like I said earlier. And I'll never, I'm going to die with my boots on because uh, I think it's not a good thing to uh, retire. I think you keep your mind, I've seen friends of mine retire and get Alzheimer's because they don't know that using their brains. You know what I mean? I'm still using my brain. I think I am, anyway. <laughs> but um, anyway, is there any questions that anybody wants to ask me at all? I'm here to ask whatever questions you have. And Good job. <laughs> Was that a comment or a question? <laughs> No comment? Good job. Oh, she's just oh, saying good you. job. Thank you so much. <laughs> For a guy that doesn't do this. For <laughs> so you say? Yeah. Uh, I think you had a very good point when you, when you talked about um, fans downloading the music legally or legally because they, they like the artist and they like the content, but that makes them want to go to the concert and see the actual artist. And, and with concert prices being so high nowadays and with all these fees and mm -hmm. stuff uh, being charged, I think that's the main way they make their money. Because yeah. I pers that's personally how I feel. I'm not gonna pay I'm not gonna pay for a single when the artist is already making millions and when shows. I can get it for free and when I have to pay hundred twenty dollars to go see them for a night. You know, yeah, I, I I get the message. Well which which is interesting because I'm a history major, so history is kind of repeating itself. People aren't buying the albums anymore. They buy in singles. If they buy anything at all, they buy a single, right? They don't buy the 10 songs or 12 songs. They buy one song or take one song. So that's the way it is also. And uh, that's one of the reasons why they're not making money anymore out there. Because the, the artist used to make money on an album. If an album was sold, they used to get a couple of bucks. Now they get a the single, they get, they're lucky to get 30 cents. So, you know, it's a big difference monetarily. Any other questions? Uh, what made you want to make Banging on Wax, knowing, you know, what it could do to the black community. You know, I'm a great believer of, of, of giving back, believe it or not, and I, I have given back. I'm very, very charity oriented, and I kind of felt the guy that brought the project to me kind of had been turned on by everybody because it was a dangerous project. I found out later, yeah. and I felt for these kids. I said, you know, I'm going to give these kids a break. And that's why I did it, because I wanted to give back, not only to the first AME church, like I said earlier, but to the community. We helped at a couple of social centers. We donated to them, and also to the kids. But it was never enough, is what the sad part was. You know, there's only so much money you can give. And uh, I did the best I could, but that's why I did it, Try to, trying to give back. When, 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 uh, our other guest comes today, he can also share some information about that. He's, we, we, we just interviewed a couple of the artists that were on that, uh, on that particular uh, CD. One of them explained, in which I, I knew a little bit about myself because I was a teenager at that time, there was somewhat of a peace treaty going on when this album was made between the Bloods and the Crips. This is coming after the 1992 riots. And for a short period of time, there was peace on the streets. That didn't last very long because a lot of things took place. But when this album was made, for the first time you're getting people who had murders on each side of, 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 of the tracks, red and blue, now doing something in the music business, which could be, although some of the lyrical content may be challenging, it was actually something positive considering everything else that was going on in the neighborhood at that time. I understand, LA looked 
The South Central LA looked horrible at that time. Buildings had been burnt down. It was it was really rough. So I'll share more with you all later about that when we get into that. But anyway, that first album, that Banging on Wax first album, was a classic. You got a copy of it? Yeah, yeah. I remember some of the songs. It's good. It's very good. I like it. <laughs> you heard by Rule of? Oh, oh, by the way, by the way, talking about hip hop, you'll get a kick out of this. I forgot to mention this. In 1986, my teacher, my mentor, Barry Gordon. Motown Records called me up and wanted to meet with me. And I, you know, I've been very successful, and so we had a meeting, and he's quite a very persuasive guy. Talked me into coming back to Motown and made me president. This white boy made me president of Motown Records, which was a big thrill for me because I'm colorblind, okay? Just so you know, where I'm very grateful that's the way I was raised. So I went back to Motown in 1986, and the first artist I brought back was Smokey Robinson with Just to See Her, which was a big hit for him. But I get a thing called Straight Outta Compton by N.W.A. And I said, oh my God, this is going to be incredible. So I called Mr. Gordy up, and I said, Barry, there's a project that I want to sign to Motown Records. He said, what is it? It's a thing called Straight Outta Compton. And he, what's the name of the group? I said, NWA. So Mr. Gordy says, what does that stand for? <laughs> and I said, Barry, I don't want to say what it stands for. <laughs> you know, all can say it, but if I say it, man, it's a dirty word. But if you say it, it don't mean nothing. But he, what are you talking about, the N word? I said, yeah, that, that's what I'm talking about. He said, I'm never going to have an act like that on Motown Records. So Barry Gordy actually turned down M.W.A., which cost Motown millions of records. I don't have to tell you that. But that, that was one of the things I forgot to mention earlier. Anyway, any more questions? Yes? Um, what's one thing you would regret in the business, whether signing someone or not signing someone? <coughs> what I regret? Yeah, or like in general, one thing you regret. I don't have a whole lot of regrets, believe it or not. Um, I regret... Uh, Missing out on an act called Queen. I don't know if you ever heard of the rock band called Queen. Oh, I went to $350,000 in a bidding war for Queen. And uh, Electra Records outbid me and went to $400,000, and I couldn't go to four fifty. dollars So that's one of the things I feel bad about because I, Freddie Mercury was, you know, a superstar. And, Queen was an incredible band, but I missed out on Queen. So I would have had seven superstars instead of six. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's the way it goes sometimes. You can't win them all. Um, what way do you think is the best, or well, what's the best way for an artist to get signed, like a rap artist? For a rap artist? To get signed with a label. Well, today, being the A and R departments, you know what the A and R departments are? Records, I mean, uh, record companies. We talked about this before. What does A and R stand for? I know what I do. It's basically interns sitting in front of TV screens, watching, I mean, like computer screens, watching YouTube or you know MySpace or whatever they're watching, and seeing what's hot out there. And so what you have to do as an artist today is you have to create a lot of your own stuff. In other words, you have to rewrite it, try to make a record, and make a, a cheap video, which today with the way that these new cameras and stuff like that, you can make a video pretty inexpensively. So you get the video, and if your, your rap is, is good, kids will start watching it. And then all of a sudden these kids will wow, this, this uh, Video's gotten over two million hits, two million, two million views. All of a sudden, they start taking you serious. But you got to get to about two million before they start taking you serious, believe it or not. And that's the way it is. And if you don't get there, you're out of luck. It's just that way. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add to what y'all were saying. Um, well, a lot of artists nowadays, they're coming up without labels, and they act like they don't care about getting signed. And I understand, yes, the labels help promote them and get them the recognition that they need, but like artists like Nipsey and like other people who don't have labels, they still come a long way in the industry. And some yes, they don't do. necessarily care about getting it. An artist today can be in business for himself. Yes. 
he may not make as much money, but he can make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this it's it's a new it's a new business. There are a lot of artists out there that are doing very well with their own labels. Yes. <coughs> so that's a good thing. Yes. In your own personal opinion, do you think this this generation of hip hip hop has its own distinct sound or style, such as the ones before us? Well. It reminds me a little of a rock and roll, like, you know, rock and roll was good golly, Miss Molly, rock around the clock, and all of a sudden we went to the Beatles, like, you know, the, the long and winding road and real classic. So hip hop is getting more sophisticated. So that's what's happening. It's making a transition to where it's getting, actually, people are enjoying it more than they were, I think, now than they were before. Because it's not demeaning to a lot of, like, in the old, the old hip hop was putting down everybody, and, and it wasn't very good, to, you know, for girls because it wasn't the proper thing to do, as you know, I and mean, they were putting down girls all the time, and uh, so I think it's gotten better. Let's put it that way. It's come out of the devil's music, if you want to call it, again, to uh, some more, uh, better music. Yes? Are there any specific hip hop artists that you enjoy today? I like um, Jay-Z a lot. He's, he's, you know, I like got the big ones. Kanye West, Kanye West. Jay-Z, I like the big guys. But uh, Eminem's not too bad for a white boy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, only one of the greatest lyricists ever. <laughs> Questions? I know you all have questions. Please ask. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, today's like trend with using auto tune, but that kind of re that's history repeating itself too. Because back then, like during the uh, Zap and Rogers, Roger and Zap, they use auto tune. So that's why. I said, <laughs> <laughs> Roger, oh, yeah. They use they use auto tune. So. Yeah, that's, that's history repeating itself. Yeah, it is history repeating itself. Very interesting. How do you feel about that? What? How do you feel about that? <laughs> well, I'm a history major, so I know history repeats itself. So you're okay with, like... I'm okay with it. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm okay with it. <laughs> I'm okay with it. Any other questions? Yes, who had well, a question? I'll, I'll tell you one thing for you. Oh, this is just my personal opinion, kind of like some advice in a way. Not sure. advice, but sure. I feel that with this with this generation, they should go back to like more of a fun thing. And I think that like artists today, they should start using like cartoons because that's what we were like raised off of. So like sampling cartoons, like that would be a good oh, yeah. investment. Yeah, that would be. Maybe they will come around to that. Yeah. Well, I have to say one thing. My Love for America has gone up today. Seeing a fine group of young people like you makes me think we're on the right track again. So I want to thank you for inviting me here to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. The key is to be better. That's a key word here, guys and girls. Better. Be better. Okay? It's very simple. If you're not better, you're not going to be successful. And that's the harsh truth. I hope I made sense. Drop the mic. So I'm glad you said that because so when I ask you all to work really hard as researchers, <laughs> that means you need to be better. We had this conversation, right? Why do we need to be better? Why do you think he's saying it? Anybody? Yes, sir, bro. To achieve success. To achieve success. Competition makes you work hard. I just, I just think if you just want something, you just, you just gotta go get it. You just gotta have a hustle mentality. I mean, like sometimes it's like it's what you know too, but sometimes it's like who, who you know. It's I hate to say that, but I was told that in eighth grade, so it always stuck with me. Why do you think that Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan? Okay, if you put them on that, then you have oh, to research. work at it. Research. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's, That's how they became the best that they are today. Michael Jordan never took a vacation while he was a player. Work at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Am I missing something? No, I'm for real. No, I said research because Kobe did study the game, and that's what made made him a uh, good good player. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but whether you're a professional athlete or a student who's going to go into an array of fields, if you don't work, you won't be good. I'm going to tell you right now. I've been a business owner and a manager and a general manager and a supervisor. Anybody that works for me that comes that has excuses all the time will not be working. Because your excuses reflect back on me. When you come to the when you come to the table and you don't work hard and you slack and you just do things to get by, you may get by for a little while, but it'll come back and it'll bite you at some point. I have been interviewing artists for the last five months. And I keep hearing this theme over and over again. And it's a theme of, I should have done this and I should have done that. Because if I did this and I did that, I would be doing this. What do you think that means? What do you all think that means? Should have worked harder. Should have worked harder, what else? Spent more time. Now when they were at the top of their game, most of the times they're around you all's age. What should they have done at that time? What was that? I said like stay working hard because like sometimes I already get caught up in the, the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Distractions. Um, if you're talking money wise, they shouldn't have invested. Like if you I don't know if you're talking money wise, but that could be part of it, yeah. Yeah, I mean yeah. if they're talking money wise, they should invest. Like if you have like a little small sum of money, you should invest that in something. Because it can go to something much bigger. I know that's what I did. I invested in a company. Mm -hmm. And now I don't have to have a job. Like, I don't have to work at McDonald's or anything like that. Because okay. I'm my own boss. But it, for a lot of people, like, they're thinking, like, oh, I got to buy a Mercedes. I got to buy a $10 million house. But when you're not making money anymore like that, you can't afford the taxes on that $10 million house. So it's just. When I was in the National Football League, every day that I drove up to the Seahawks facility, there was a row of cars that I saw lined up in the same place. 22s, 24s, 26s. Lamborghinis, Ferraris, Benzes, BMWs, all the cars you can think of. Who do you think they belong to? Players. No. Which players? No. The practice team. Which players? The practice team. I'm, I'm being serious here. The practice team. I'm going to tell you who they belong to. The owners. All the African American players on that team own those cars. Yeah. You know what else I noticed when I was there? Who owned? Prius. Prius. Ford Prius didn't exist. <laughs> We're going back 14 years ago. There was no, well, there was a Prius, but nobody was buying it. Not like now. Who owned the Ford Explorer, simple Honda Accord, or maybe had a Mercedes but didn't have, have crocodile seats <laughs> inside of the car? Who owned that? The white, the white players. The white players. Or the white players or the black players who understood? The black players who understood. You can have all those nice things if you've got everything else taken care of. Mm -hmm. You understand? But when you're living beyond your means, me included, I cannot tell you how much money I blew. She don't even know how much money I blew. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time she's hearing this conversation. I can't tell you because I'm trying to live beyond my means. When you're on an airplane and you're shooting dice like you do in the neighborhood and you're blowing sixty thousand dollars, this is what you did. On, this is hip hop culture because this is what you did. In, what the dope dealers did on the streets, right? I'm gonna tell you some a real story. I was in Rolling Thirties neighborhood with my with my buddy. His name was Choice. He was from East Coast Crips. I thought I was cool. I was in high school. Rolling my car up there. We go to a dice game. We beat everybody. Took the money. What do you think those rolling thirties did? <laughs> you know what that means? <laughs> I thought I was gonna die. I put my choice in. <laughs> what you hold on, hold on. This is serious. I put my key in the trunk of my car because choice said put your key in the trunk. Now I wasn't a gangster, but I I was learning the code. And I turned the key. He said, we got a problem here. He was playing poker. And had we lost that poker game. I wouldn't be standing in front of you right now. Wow. That's the last time I hung out with any gangsters. Damn. He's playing poker. 12 gauge, M16. Let me tell you where these guns came from. This is some other history that you, you probably haven't learned about. There were business deals being done on the streets.
between dirty cops, FBI informants, and dope dealers. And they were smuggling guns into the neighborhoods. How in the hell can a gangster get an M16? <laughs> Grenade launchers. All of these things were in the neighborhood. Some of them still are. This is what the kind of firepower they had in their hand. By the grace of God, I'm still here. Obviously, I was meant to do something else besides being a young, ignorant person as I was being at that time. But that same mentality in the streets that was part of hip-hop culture and some of the bad parts of it about hustling and, and slanging, and we, that's a whole deeper conversation, existed in the NFL locker room. So when some certain players who don't have the money to do this, when you're a thousandaire, especially, stop trying to live like a millionaire. You don't have the, the money to do it. You make two and a quarter that is taxed in every single state that you go to. How much money are you really walking away with at the end of the year? And you're trying to live like, the, like Randy Moss who's making how much? And even he's living beyond his means. So when you're not making that money and you're, oh, I just lost $60,000 in a dice game on an airplane. The reason why I'm so passionate about educating you all, and I'm not saying that you all are foolish enough to do this, but educating young people in general, because I talk to young people a lot younger than you in the neighborhood, is so that they don't make the same mistakes we made. Some of the times where you hear these guys and they're saying certain things is because they don't want you to do what they did. All of you have a great opportunity right here. You're solid researchers. In a on a college campus and you have an opportunity to, they're going to listen to you more, the young people are going to listen to you more than they're going to listen to me. Because now I'm becoming one of the older guys. Your voice means more to them than my voice does. So when you go out in the community, whether it's in the Valley or in San Gabriel Valley or in South Central LA, and you talk to these young people, I hope some of you do, if you see something they're doing that needs to be corrected, you have an opportunity now as a researcher who knows the truth of what, what is important. You just heard today, Hip-hop has a future. This is from someone who's in the business who signed artists who've made a lot of money. This culture has a future. This is why this culture and this class is on this campus, because it's important. It wouldn't be here if it wasn't important. We wouldn't be talking about these topics if it wasn't for San Francisco State, 1969, and Kent State before that, fighting for irrelevant and important information in classrooms. Let me find out where our artist is. He should be close. <coughs> we may only have about 10 minutes to talk with him because we're running short on time. Hello? 3504. Come on to the third floor, 3504. All right. Yes. Mr. Regan mentioned uh, Chip Murray. He's a colleague of mine at USC now. He's our what we call a senior professor of religion, senior pastor in residence. He's a wonderful man. Yes. Chip Murray is also one of the reasons why I stopped hanging out with knuckleheads. It took a pastor to do it the government and the police department couldn't do. That whole peace treaty thing that I was talking to you all about, that was because of Chip Murray. When he went out on the streets after the riots, because of their respect for him, the gangsters backed down. There was a time back in the day when gangsters, when they would come to a church, they'd pull their pants up, button their shirt up, yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. That was the code. That doesn't necessarily exist today. You also knew the difference between the blood and the crypt back in the day because one side wore blue and one side wore red. Now they wear hammer pants and skinny jeans, and I'm confused to <laughs> ride skateboards. I'm like, sometimes I feel like I've been gone for a long time. What? What? I don't know. I can't tell you apart from the kids in the suburbs. But anyway, that's, but that's, that's fine, too. It's part of the culture. But I'm saying it is important for us to continue to, to learn information, learn the history, but also know that there is hope for the future in this culture. This culture is what is going to, to save and help the community rise. The older folks, they've done 
what they could do. But it's up to this culture. When, we, when I keep hearing about young black men being assaulted and or murdered by the police department, the information that came from hip hop is what used to give the information to the streets. It was a CNN to the streets on how to address a police officer, on how to address <coughs> legal matters, on how to carry yourself in different environments. You can't talk how you talk to your homies when you go into a business environment. You will not be in business very long. Let me tell you something about Easy e In 1993, I was in a place called a Vulture Sante on 26th and San Vicente, right outside of Santa Monica in Brentwood. I found him. You found him? Really quick. Do you think Easy e was banging on wax when he was in that meeting? Or he was appropriate. Hey, man. Hey, how you doing? Hey, God. Hey, we'll talk about this later. All right. Mr. Hatton. Hey, what's going on, my brother? Sorry I'm late, y'all. I was at USC, man. No disrespect. <laughs> <laughs> I work there, too. It's all right. <laughs> so for the next 10 minutes or so, Mr. Havoc is going to uh, just talk to you a little bit about the business and about, about his experience. He also, he was, he was uh, one of the founders of, of South Central Cartel and signed under Mr. Russ Regan. And uh, yeah, my just, first record deal. Well, my name is Havoc. It's spelled H-A-V-O-C. Um, I have a nickname known as the Mouthpiece. Um, I got that name honestly, so y'all know before the end of this class where I got it. But uh, anyway, uh, my music journey <laughs> began as a celebrity kid. Um, I was born a celebrity kid. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, and I was um, blessed to be um, the son of uh, Robert Squirrel Lester. Uh, my father sings with a group called the Shylights. Oh, uh, yeah. Right, it just was on Unsung last week. They did a whole little story on my dad's group. Uh, my sisters was on there representing, my sister Latoya and my sister Crystal um, was representing my father. But anyway, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I grew up around, you know, um, been in, around a lot of entertainers, you know, pop staple and the staple singers, the emotions, um, you know, um, just, you know, basically being in the music game, been growing up around my father. Then I got a chance to, you know, travel, and I came to California in 1973. Don't let that give away my age. But um, I came here, and I was blessed enough to stay with the Jackson Five for about three weeks. I got a chance to meet Michael, Brandy, Marlon. Janet, got a chance to, you know, hang out with the Jackson 5, so that was like something that really touched my heart, to be able to be in the house with the Jackson 5, playing with the dog, um, um, Bolo, and, you know, and all of those stuff, you know what I mean? And then me and Janet and my sister, we was walking up the hills, and Phyllis Dillis gave me and my sister and Janet some cookies and milk. Like, come on in, Janet! Who is your cute little friend? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, Phyllis Diller is a comedian, yeah. legend in the right. business. You know, she always has a little stem on her cigarette, and, you know what I mean? But anyway, um, I said, well, I'm coming back here. When I get old, I'm coming back to California. So when I graduated out of high school, I said, well, I'm on the way to Cali. So I flew out to Cali in 1980, and that's when my hip-hop story begins in um, California. So my first couple of years here, I was getting to know California, trying to figure out what my forte was going to be. Joe Jackson called me and asked me, did I know how to play drums? I said no. So they blew up an opportunity right off the back. I had to let that go. So anyway, um, I went to Southwest College for a year, you know, um, took some classes, kind of keep my education, you know, right. And um, then finally, um, I um, bumped into, um, I was um, going to work one day. I was working for the Broadway, the only job I had in California. <laughs> I worked at the Broadway over there on um, Crenshaw and um, King Boulevard. That was like Macy's back in the day. Yeah, like, so one day I was getting I'm ready for work, and a lady that lived upstairs from me was, me and her was having some coffee talking, and her daughter came out, and she just kept looking at me so I could feel she had a crush on the little player. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go on and, you know what I mean, put it down on her, you know what I mean? So next thing you know, me and her kind of, you know, liking each other, whatever. And one day her brother pops up to her house, and his name is Prodigy. Prodigy is my partner in crime. His name is Austin Patterson. And he came in with this big old black briefcase and something. I thought, what you got, your runaway clothes in there or something? Yeah. You know what I mean? He's like, no, they raps in there. I'm like, raps? Like, let me see. So he opened up, he got stacks and stacks of racks, right? I'm like, let me hear something, right? 
So they got the busting for me, busting for me. And I'm like, oh man, you are. You remind me of Eugene Record of the Shy Lights. You know, he was a, you know, he wrote all of these Shy Lights hit records, have you seen the old girl, produced them and all of that. So Prodigy reminded me of Eugene Record. So I was like, you know what, we need to hook up, man. You know what I'm saying? My dad in the Shy Lights, man, I got major hookups. I'm just, you know. I wasn't a mouthpiece, man, but I was trying to get my little forte in there. But anyway, I talked him into it, right? So we started our first group called Mafia Style. This was in like 85, 85, late 85, early um, 86. Um, from that point on, me and Prodigy and us, we started getting other members, you know, Prodigy's first cousin, Ryan son, came into the group, LV, he was going to church singing. So we put LV, he won, you know, our Grammy. For Gangsta's Paradise with Coolio, I'm sure y'all familiar with the song Gangsta's Paradise. But anyway, LV on that song is from South Central Cartel. But anyway, we continued to grow and went through name changes, and then finally we came on the name South Central Cartel in late '88, early um, um, 1989. So for then on, we want to shout out first underground video under my label, which was called GWK Records, Gangsta's with Knowledge who was helped started by a, a good friend of mine and Russ's name, Willie James. Willie James was the owner of New Concept Marketing, which helped me start my own label, which was about 80, late 88, um, um, 89. So, um, so we was um, you know, working independent, you know, doing our little thing then, and somehow another guy that worked with um, Willie James worked there in New Russ. So he um, heard our album, which was South Central Madness at the time, and he loved it. So he took it to Russ. Russ heard it, and he can take you from that point on when he heard the record and, and told us to come sign South Central Quartel, and, and his name was made <laughs> right there. That's good. And Russ Regan, right here, my, uh, I'm, um, this is a very special man right here to me, not just musically, but personally. You know what I'm saying? We're like family. You know, his son is like my brother. His wife is like, oh, she treats me like her son, you know what I mean? And she's really helping me out with my new situation that I'm got that I got going on right now. But I gotta keep that hush, it should beat me up. Cheryl don't play. Hey, am I right, Russ? <laughs> Cheryl don't play, right? <laughs> Cheryl don't play. <laughs> so anyway, I got the chance to get my first deal with Russ. Then um, from there on, I got the chance to move to um, to be the first West Coast group in the history of uh, hip hop to sign to Def Jam Records. Might want to write that down. Um, no group prior to South Central Cartel was never signed to a historic East Coast label, which was basically East Coast driven. You know what I mean? And because I had now started to develop my mouthpiece, you know what I mean, I got a chance to be blessed and I met um, <coughs> Russell Simmons at a convention called Jack the Rapper. Jack the Rapper is a, a rap convention that goes on that used to go on in Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia, back in the 80s and 90s, it was real big. You know, all the rappers from all over the world come to this convention. So um, I was going through transition with GWK because um, Quality was going through some transition with their parent company, which was called Artec. Artec got into some financial situations that stemmed on down to Quality. So Russ Band, my, you know, my, my, not only my, you know, my, my, my father and all of that, he agreed to let South Central Quartel go with no strings attached, which we found very, you know, strange. Because in the music game, it's dog eat dog. You know what I mean? There ain't nobody letting nobody go away from free, for free. Especially to a company like Def Jam. Let's go, we wound up sounding the Def Jam for like almost a half a million dollars, which was, you know, back then was some pretty decent money for seven, you know, um, street guys, you know what I mean? And um, so we wound up, our first album debuted at number four on R&B Billboard, which was, a gangster album called In Gas We Trust. In Gas We Trust, um, so like I say, it instantly, you know, was a classic because it had Tupac Shakur on there, Ice T, Spice One, um, Big Mike from the Ghetto Boys, MCA. It was basically, you know, gangster music at its finest. To that point that the hardest gangster music was out at that point probably was Scarface. And NWA was sort of sorta gangster, but they was more political. South Central Cartel was straight thugs. We were straight, like when we go do shows or we get in, we go to a hotel, we get on the elevator, and you see us get on the elevator, you getting off. <laughs> For real, you getting off. It, 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 I mean, just the stereotype of the look with the braids, like you said, the long braid, wear the khaki with the Chuck Taylor. Yeah, excuse my shoes today. I'm running through all types of stuff today, but um, um, 
Anyway, um, um, you know, we um, got a chance to be on Tales from the Hood soundtrack. We got a chance to be on Jerry Maguire soundtrack. We got a song in the Eight Mile movie with Eminem. Um, we um, basically did a lot of travel the world, been, you know, basically everywhere from, um, uh, um, from Jamaica to Japan to Europe to Can Canada, Mexico. So the music business has been very good to, you know, a brother and a lot of other brothers out here on the West Coast. Does anyone have a question for? Yeah. So for, for Mr. I got Hatton. a long story, so y'all need five Before, classes. We, we, need to have we got five about weeks. two minutes <laughs> left. Anybody? Come <laughs> out and let me in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead, my brother. <laughs> I was joking because I know the media kind of makes him look like a bad guy, but like, how is he personally like? Joe? Yeah, Joe, Joe Jackson. Oh, Joe Jack. Okay, Joe Jackson. See, a lot of people get Joe Jackson um, um, misunderstood because he um, cared about his. Um, son's um, and his daughter's career. He might have been a little bit, um, what you say, we say uh, uh, too aggressive, but if, if, if he didn't do it, they wouldn't have been pushed to the greatness that they were. So, you know, I kind of credited, you know, Joe as being, you know, a motivator for them. But personally, Joe taught me how to play pool when I was like 11, 12 years old. Matter of fact, I was just with him a couple of years ago with Russ at my dad's concert, at my dad's last concert alive. Russ happened to be there with me, and Joe happened to be there that day too. Right. And he knows me since, Joe's been knowing me since I was this big right here, Joe Jack. He's a great guy, man. I love Joe Jack. He's a great guy. All right, so you got comedy, you got business, and you got everything else today. Let's give our guests a hand, please.